What up, guys? How's it going? How's it going? Happy almost new year. Have I been away for a minute or two? Can you tell it's been busy at work? Because I'm still at work again today. Um, but I want to tell you guys about an experience I just had that I thought might be relevant to you guys. <clears throat> so if this is your first time seeing me, I'm Dr. Andre Pines, the pre-med productivity expert. And today I'm going to tell you guys the uncomfortable secret about being a successful pre-med, being successful in your life, and getting to medical school. And it starts with, and we'll just lay it out. You have to be able to be honest with yourself. And you have to be able to surround yourself with people who can be honest with you as well. And so often, uh, it feels much more comfortable, much more at ease to have a bunch of yes men around us and to be our own yes men and to justify what we're doing and our, our failures and our lack of effort just justify it. Oh, it's because of this. Oh, I don't have the money. Oh, I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. I don't have the all the things you want to make excuses about instead of focusing on what the real issue is. And where this came up is last night, um, I had a patient um, in the first part of my shift. So I'm still on shift now. But last night in the first part of my shift, I had a patient who was a long-term drug abuser. And anybody who knows stuff about drug abusers, substance abusers, they tend to have personality defects, right? And this is not judging people, this is just the truth, right? You get involved in that kind of stuff, you, there's something about your personality, you, you, know, you end up being like needy, or there's some, there's some un, unbalance in your personality. And so this uh, woman is delivering a baby, she's coming in to, to deliver her baby, and from moment one when I meet her and she wants the epidural, she's completely concerned about pain. My pain is so severe, my pain is so severe, I need something, I need something, I need something. I start the epidural, I didn't even start it. All I did was drape her back, like sterilize her back. She's like, oh, I feel better already. And I was like, I haven't done anything. And so <laughs> it was that kind of setup. And so eventually I put the epidural in. Um, she's not feeling pain relief immediately. And so she's concerned and she's upset. And I said, it's gonna happen, give it time, have some pain relief. So I come back probably about an hour later to check on her. And uh, she is comfortable, laying there, totally content, laboring. I was like, great. I get a call about three, four hours later saying, can you turn the epidural down, patient, too weak to push. And I come in the room and I'm looking at this lady and she's very comfortable. I said, okay, you know, she's too comfortable, I'll turn the epidural down. I watch her push and she's not pushing at all. Like there's no movement of the baby. She's literally like, like, you know, that fake kind of, oh yeah, right. no pushing happening. And so I was like, okay, great, we do that. I leave, I get Paige about another 45 minutes after that saying, oh, she's in tremendous excruciating pain. She needs pain relief right now. So I run in there and this lady is one of the most comfortable looking patients I've ever seen in my life for someone who's having 10 out of 10 pain. And she's like, I'm just having too much pain to push. And I said, man, I said, let's have an honest conversation right now. I said, I was in here earlier watching her pushing. Your pushing is horrible. It's terrible. It's awful. It's no good. You're an awful, no good pusher. And I said, I'm watching you push now with pain and you're pushing a little bit better, but you're still not really pushing. You're not putting any effort in. And she said, well, if you don't think I can push, then just let's just do a C-section. And I said, ma'am, it's not about doing a C-section, but it's about you understanding the fact that everyone here can sit here and cheer you on until you're doing a great job of pushing, but all that's gonna happen is you're gonna keep giving us these fake, false, no baby movement pushes. It's my job, right, to look out for you as the anesthesiologist, right? I'm anesthesia, I'm the preventative specialty. You are a person who has a long history of substance abuse. That means when you have pain, it's gonna be difficult to treat your pain because you've been treating your pain by yourself for a long, long time. If you have to go to C-section, you're gonna have three to four days of recovery where you're gonna be in a lot of pain and we're gonna to struggle to control that pain. So what your options are right now is that we can keep the epidural low like this, you can have some pain and you can push effectively and get the baby out and have maybe an hour of pain or you can sit here and not push and believe you're pushing and you can be in pain for the next three days after your C-section. And it was interesting because <laughs> OB didn't like that. And so OB pulled me outside and said, listen, you can't tell a patient they're not pushing well and blah, 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 all this stuff and scare them. And then as we're outside talking, the husband came out and actually grabbed me. And the husband brought me back in. He's like, oh, she wants to talk to you. So we go back inside. So all of us is a big group. And the patient's like, I feel like... I feel like I can try to push. And I said, yeah, you gotta feel that eye of the tiger. And I started singing eye of the tiger. You know what I'm talking about? It's just the eye of the tiger. It's the thrill of the fight. Rising up to the challenge of our rivals. That song, you know what I'm talking about, right? So 
I start singing this song, and she's like, yeah, more of that. So then the husband puts on the actual song, and myself and the husband are sitting there, and we're singing uh, Eye of the Tiger to this lady as she's pushing, and she got the baby out in like 15 minutes. And so many of you guys are false pushers. So many of you guys are false laborers where you could have all your pre-med success right there in front of you. You could have medical school in a second. You know what you have to do, but you don't execute. You want to sit there and you want to lie to yourself and you want to let everybody around you tell you, oh, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing the best you can. You're doing your best. When you know darn well you aren't doing your best. Or maybe you don't know you're not doing your best because everyone around you is telling you you are. I encourage you guys, if you want to be successful, if you want to be a great pre-med, if you want to get to medical school, you got to have people around you who are willing to be honest with you and tell you you're a terrible, ain't nothing pusher. That way you can get on the real grind and start working towards your goals. You can't have yes men around you. And one of the things that I do for students when I work with them, and, and I guess it's a shock to them, and it's, I come off as very abrasive. It's one of the things I, in constantly in comments I get when I go out and give talks is, Dr. Pineset is abrasive. Dr. Pineset is aggressive. Dr. Pineset is, uh, what's it, harsh. They say all these words. And the reason everybody says these words, whenever I see those, I'm like, yes, yes, I am. And I'll tell people, when I start a talk, now I, I preface it. I say, hey, guys, I just want you to know, Today we're going to do a talk, and you're going to think that I am an, a straight-up asshole. I am an a-hole with a capital A. That's me. And I hope you think I'm an a-hole. If I leave here and you don't think I'm an a-hole, I haven't done my job. Because everybody else at this conference, or everyone else you've talked to, all your premium advisors, everybody either wants to tell you, hey, you have no hope, give up, and go away. You can't get to medical school. You're not qualified. And you want to hear that because that gives you a, 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 an, an escape route, right? It's like, oh, it's not my fault that I'm not getting A's. It's, it's I'm, I'm not, I, don't, I don't have the resources. I'm not uh, intelligent enough to get to medical school. That's why I won't get there instead of it just being you, not having the study skills. So, right, it's either that or the other case is everyone telling you, oh, you're going to be great. Yeah, just apply. And this happens all the time where people will come to me. Or they'll send me an email or they'll meet with me and they're like, man, your advice is totally different than what everybody else is telling me. Everyone else is telling me just to apply that I'll be fine. Like, oh, just, just some, apply to a whole bunch of schools and I'll be okay. I'll get in somewhere. And I said, because they don't want to hurt your feelings. They want to tell you that what you've been doing is okay and you can settle and you can just, oh, I'll just submit my application to a lot of schools and hope for the best. Think about that. Is that great logic? Oh, you know what? You're not qualified to get into any one school. So if you just apply to 50 schools, someone will accept you. Tell me right now, does that sound like a reasonable strategy to you guys? I don't think that your grades are that great. So let's apply to 50,000 schools and hope for the best. Who wants to hope about medical school? Who wants to wish, right, and pray, click their heels together, they get to medical school? As opposed to who wants to be confident about getting to medical school, and executing, and getting where they want to go. I don't believe in, forget chance, forget luck. I don't like 50-50 odds. I don't like, I was just having this conversation with my mom, and I think my mom was on here. Maybe she hopped off. But my mom was at my house earlier this week, and she was having fun. And she had just come from Vegas, and we were talking about gambling. And for the first time ever, my mom won at the casino. And we were talking about how we can't stand to gamble because I can't stand to lose. It's too much up in the air. I need certainty. I need to know, like I need like to be able to count cards or stack the deck. I need something to happen for me, for me to be able to gamble effectively because I don't like that uncertainty. I like creating certainty through my hard work, through my dedication, through my consistency, and my execution of a plan to get somewhere. And I will not justify to myself subpar behavior, subpar performance, because at the end of the day, guys, if you aren't getting the results you want, it's your fault. And that is why people think I'm abrasive. When I go out to events, I don't want to hear excuses. I'm dead serious about no excuses, just dominate. I'll come out there. You'll try to tell me how, oh, it's because my mom died, so I couldn't do. I don't care about your mom dying. I don't care. Why couldn't you execute on the test? Why couldn't you get it done? And the perfect example of this, and I'll tell the full story in another video, but I had a student re just recently, just recently, one of my students, and it was a very proud moment for me, and it made me want to tear up because it was so beautiful of how this person embodied the no excuse to just dominate and they got what I was talking about. And in my study course, we talk about all these distractions and life things and, and how people are gonna die and you're gonna, and, and tragedy's gonna strike, there's gonna be a hurricane, there's gonna be whatever it is. I don't give a good darn nothing about a storm, I don't give a good darn nothing about death, I don't give a good enough about your girlfriend, your boyfriend breaking up with you. And one of my students, it was so perfect. He lost three relatives in a two-week span, including both parents. 
in a two-week span, right before finals, lost the family. He had two weeks left of the, of the semester. And he had to make a decision. Am I going to make an excuse and say, oh, listen, my whole family just died. I got to go home and mourn with everybody and be there at the funeral and do all those kind of things. And I got to withdraw from all my classes and retake them next semester. Or I can do what I need to do to execute. I can ignore all that mourning and death and I can get about my business and get stuff done. And this student to the shock of everyone around him who thought, oh yeah, it's appropriate for you to, to quit and give up and go home and mourn and come back and do this again. I said, no, 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 no. I want to apply to medical school this year, so I'm going to get here. I'm going to execute on my final exams and went in. And not only did he take the final exams, not only did he finish up the semester, but he finished up getting a almost straight A's and ended up acing almost all of his final exams because he studied through the tears because he studied through the sadness, because he refused to be turned away by stuff that is trivialities that are excuses. Justifying, oh, I'm just too emotional to take my finals. Forget that. Sack up, be a man about it, be a woman about it, and deliver on the test. If you got a baby inside you, push the baby out. If you got a final exam, deliver. Stop justifying, stop wanting to feel comfortable. Oh, I don't want to have any pain. I just, oh gosh, I'm just, there's just too much on me. It's just too difficult to go forward. I don't have any sympathy for that. And if that makes me harsh, if that makes me whatever, fine. But you know what that also makes me? It makes me effective. Effective for myself and effective for helping you guys. Because I'm not going to sit there and tell you, oh yeah, your application's all right, just apply. Because that's bullshit, right? It's terrible advice. Oh yeah, you know, your application is not the best I've seen, but, you know, just give it a shot. Go ahead and spend a couple thousand dollars applying to medical school and just hope for the best. That's horrible. Horrible, 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 horrible. And so many of you guys are doing the same thing to yourself. We got MCAT time coming up, right? Into January, right? People are, oh, over winter break, stressed and trying to get those last bit of studying in for their MCAT. And you know, guys, come on, it's December 31st. Your test might be January 22nd. You got three weeks. If your score is 485 and you've seen no growth in six months, how are you all of a sudden going to go from 485 to 510 in three weeks? Yet, you're going to keep your test scheduled for that date, knowing you need a 510, knowing that's what you're shooting for, knowing you're not going to reach it because you're going to justify yourself. Oh, I'm just going to go ahead and take the MCAT and see what happens. And do you know what happens when that happens? Terrible stuff. You'll get that 485. And now you've got a 485 on your track record to go with your average GPA. So what do you have to do? You take the MCAT again. And then you don't want to take the whole time to do the MCAT. You're like, well, I've been studying for six months. Let me go ahead and study for just four weeks. And then all of a sudden, I'm going to be ready for the MCAT. And you'll study for four weeks. And you get another. You get a 495. Now you've got two MCAT scores. And if you guys know about how medical schools look at MCATs, you guys know that after the second MCAT, medical schools start looking at you crazy. Like, mm, is it really count? If it took them five attempts to score well on the MCAT? And it's all because you had to justify, oh, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. It'll be, it'll be, I just, just take my chance. I'm going to roll the dice. I'm going to, oh, bah, bust out, right? You bust it. Blackjack, nope, bust it. Because you didn't want to take the time to do it right. Because you didn't want to be honest with yourself and be real and be harsh and be critical and tell yourself, man, I'm not studying effectively. I'm not where I need to be right now to do well on the MCAT. I need to push my test date back. I know it's going to cost me some money. I know it's going to cost me a whole lot more study time, a whole lot more study stress, but it's important that I do that so that way I don't spend right the extra money for the MCAT. I don't have to buy a whole nother prep class. I don't have to go through a whole admission cycle. I don't have to push all these things back that we never think about. All because you didn't want to be uncomfortable and you didn't want to be real with yourself. And the last thing I'll say, and then I'll hop off here. If you are someone's real friend or real family, stop condoning their laziness. Stop condoning their half ass effort. If you care about somebody, care about somebody. Be about someone and love them enough to be honest with them. Brutally honest and tell them when they're messing up. Because without people in my life that would tell me, like, listen, you're veering off path. I know that you're doing some things that aren't things you should be doing. I wouldn't get there. Because there's plenty of times, guys, you know it. 
It's easy to justify things to ourselves because we're on the inside. We feel the tired. We feel the stress. So it's easy for us to say, mm, I'm just too tired to work today. But if you can surround yourself with other people who are going to pick up the slack when you're down, bam, there you go. Right? And to stay on the topic of dependency, right? And drug dependency is people dependency. How many of you guys are lazy ass people and you get with a lazy ass person because you're like, man, if we're two lazies together, then you won't check me on my laziness. Oh, it'll be okay. We'll be lazy together. We can just lay in bed all day. We don't have to do no studying, right? That's what you guys think, right? You don't want someone to call you out on your BS. But people who are successful, if you look, and people trip off this, but look, <laughs> look at who people who are successful, who they roll with. If you want to go to the top, your partner has to be wanting to go to the top too. Because it ain't going to work if you're striving for the top and they're not. And I don't know if you guys, so this is going to be a real abstract reference. And I apologize in advance for this, but it's very abstract. So I don't know if you guys have seen the show Rain. It's like a TD Bopper version of the Tudors. And it's like, not medieval times, but whatever, like, you know, back when like France and England used to get into it. And like King Henry and stuff. Anybody seen the show? I won't make the reference if no one's seen the show. Let me know. Comment right now if you've seen that show. Because if not, I won't make the reference. All right, we'll make the reference anyway. <laughs> so in this show reign, there's royals and there's political people. And it's like any like medieval times thing, right? Everybody wants to get in good with the king. And everybody wants to either be king or be a duke or a duchess or something like that, right? This, let's just set it up, right? Old school times, everybody... The, the, way to, the way to be safe and the way to get money is to be cool with the king, is to be, you know, like high in court and be favored in court. <laughs> so, okay, we do a tutors reference. I like the tutors. My wife is on here. She likes the tutors. So we can talk about tutors. But anyway, so every time there's medieval times and there's a king, everyone tries to suck up to the king because the king can either cut your head off or he can bestow you all these lands. And so the way to get ahead in court in old school times was to be all like de deceiving and to, right, you got to be cunning and you got to be willing to, to turn in other people to elevate your status. Like, oh, that Duke, he's not a real supporter of the king. Cut his head off. And then when the king cuts his head off, he gives you that guy's land. Now, being cunning and being beguiling, all that kind of stuff only works. You can only ascend the ladder in court if your partner's willing to do the same thing. Because at any time, your partner can be called in for questioning and they've got to know, <laughs> right, they've got to know, no, 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 no. Yes, Duke John did not, it's absolutely true. We saw him stealing, right? You got to have your partner back you up. And this was super abstract. But in, <laughs> but in the more like current times, my wife and I have this discussion all the time. And I said, listen, if anything ever goes down, <laughs> if the police ever show up at the house, there's only one word we say to them. One word. What is it? Abogado. It's lawyer. We're not saying nothing. I don't know nothing. I haven't heard nothing about that. I don't know where the money is. I don't know what happened, right? I don't know where the weapon is, right? You, you got to have a partner who will hide the murder weapon. That's what you got to have. And I'm not condoning murder, but what I'm saying is, is if you don't have a partner who's willing to be like, nope, I haven't seen him, and you're underneath the couch, then you don't have the right partner for you. And if you don't have a partner, if you're walking out the door like, hey, listen, I'm going to go murder this guy, and they're not willing to say, listen, don't go murder them. That's the wrong thing. And they just want to be like, okay, well, maybe he's got to murder somebody. That's not the partner you need. So what you guys need is someone who's going to support you, but at the same time, hold you accountable. Hold you accountable because you know when you're not working. And if it's so easy, right? And this is the other thing, right? So this is a lot of emails I get. And that's why I get, I get frustrated answering emails because I get so many emails, people looking for me to agree with them and justify what they have to say. Send me an email saying, listen, um, my GPA is 2.5, but I don't want to wait another year. I just want to apply this year. Do you think that's a good idea? I think it's a good idea. And what they want me to do is say, yes, that's a good idea. And then when I say, no, it's not a good idea, you know what I get? And this is why I, it's tough for me to answer email sometimes is I get hate email back. Dr. Pine said, you're, you're so negative. You tell me I can't get in this year. Well, I'm going to apply anyway, and I'm going to get in. I'm going to get in. And I'm like, well, then why would you email me? You were only looking for affirmation. You were looking for me to tell you that, listen, your terrible application will be fine. Yes, apply with your terrible application. You're all of a sudden going to get into medical school, even though we both know that medical schools don't accept people with 2.5 GPAs. Stop it. Stop looking for people to put around you who are just going to 
be yes men and support you because I'm not that and you should want people around you who aren't that because I'll crack the whip. People know when you have a coaching session with me, it's 50 minutes of me braiding you and telling you how you're not perfect, right? It's me going after you for hours, talking about for two hours. And this, is, this has happened. I've had people cry in coaching sessions. I don't care. Tears don't phase me at all. Learn through the tears. Cry if you want to, but learn through the tears because I'm going to hurt your feelings and I'm going to hurt your feelings on purpose because everyone's told you you're their perfect little angel and you're wonderful and you're on your track. And I'm going to tell you, listen, your application is dog pile garbage. It's terrible. It's feces in a bag. That's what your application is. So now you have two choices. You can either accept that your application is dog pile. It's terrible, right? And you can do the work required that I'm telling you and giving you strategies to make it better. Or you can cry. It's up to you. Two choices. You can cry and shut it down. Oh, gosh. Oh, Dr. Bites, that's so mean. He was mean to me. He told me I'm not perfect. Oh. Or you can be like, man, I appreciate that he was honest with me. Because I know I've been stressing about my terrible 1.1 GPA. I have understood that I haven't been doing the extracurriculars required. I know this. I know this. So I'm going to stop lying to myself. And I'm going to listen to Dr. Pine said, be critical of me. Critical, guys. Can you be critical of yourself and can you put other can you tolerate and accept constructive feedback? Because there's no reason someone should be crying in a session with me. But it happens because people aren't used to hearing that they're not the greatest thing since sliced bread. Because they don't tell themselves that. They don't analyze their own behavior. They don't look at themselves like, man, okay, yes, I got an A on the test. But I got an A on the test cramming. The whole three days before the test, I was stressed out. I was like on the verge of death. And the only reason I was able to get that was because I got a key from my buddy who had a great study guide. But if he wasn't there, I wouldn't have got that. And if the test wasn't super easy, like, stop. Just, oh, I got an A. Whew. I don't have to think about it. No, you got an A, but you were stressed out. It was difficult. And you barely skate by and got that A. People who get to medical school don't do that. Because that A is going to turn into a B the next quarter. It turns into a C the next quarter. Right? We all experience this. Who's experienced this my upperclassmen? You get to junior, freshman year, and this happens a lot. You even, oh, you're doing, you're a 4.7 student in high school. Freshman year comes up. Oh, snap. Those A's turn into B's. Ooh, okay. All right. I'll be all right. It's all right. It's got a B. You know, it's good. It's good. I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm just getting my, my feet wet in college. I'll be okay. I'll be okay. So sophomore year. C's. Okay, all right, it's okay, it's okay. You know, that was O-Chem. It was a hard class. I got a C. It's all right, it's all right. Next year, you get to biochemistry, you get your D. Oh, dang it, I got a D in biochem. I think, I think, I think, I think, I might have a problem with my studying. Hmm, maybe I should become a better studier. Uh, but that's a lot of work. Maybe I'll just tell myself it's going to be okay and take a bunch more classes senior year and it's going to be all right. Okay. And I'll add in studying for the MCAT and I'll add in preparing for my application and my grades are going to go up. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great plan. No guys. Nope. Not a chance. So anyway, have I ranted enough this morning? Uh, I'm going to go back to work. I should probably, should I work? You guys think? Are there pregnant ladies who need me to epiduralize them? Um, I'm really shocked my pager didn't go off. Normally these live streams, it's like the pager has a sense for when I'm going live with you guys and wants to uh, chime in. But I hope everyone is having a uh, had a great holiday, Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever it is you celebrate. Um, and I hope everyone's having to have a safe New Year tonight. I am actually going to go out on New Year's for the first time in forever tonight because I feel like New Year's gets a little crazy. Like New Year's, 4th of July, people get a little crazy. But I'm actually going to go out because... It has been a grind of the last couple months, to say the least, getting courses out. And in the last month, like if you guys have noticed, I'm supposed to go live, like an actual scheduled live stream to announce the winner of the, uh, of, uh, the free course uh, last week. And I haven't had an opportunity to go live at a regular time because my schedule has been so crazy. I've been working at the hospital like around the clock. But we will announce, what's today? Today's Sunday, the 31st. So tomorrow, January 1st, at... 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we will announce uh, who won uh, the free enrollment in my $500 uh, How to Dominate Pre-Med course. If you guys haven't checked that course out, you should check it out. It's amazing. It's well worth the money, guys. It's a pre-med advisor on demand. It's 20-something hours of me kicking your butt and telling you how to get to medical school. So check that out. Uh, as always, guys, 
Have a wonderful, wonderful week. Have a wonderful, wonderful new year. Be safe tonight. Stay away from the crazies. Don't go out to Times Square for minus 11 degree weather. For what? Stay at home or go somewhere, right? Be safe. Um, and everyone have a great, great day. The website is www.prebadproductivity.com. And as always, guys, if you like these videos, share these videos, come back. Make sure, if you want to know when I'm going live, click the toggle, those three dots on the top right of the video. Click those. It'll drop down. Turn on live notifications so you can know when I'm going live. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. I will see you tomorrow. Um, and, you know, depending on how the day goes today, maybe I'll go live some more if you guys want some more live content. Um, but, yeah, everyone... Be honest, be real, be truthful with yourself, and be truthful with others, and look for real, honest, critical feedback that's going to help you get where you want to go, not just people pumping you up and promoting you and making you feel good when you know you're, you're, a, you're a bum. Don't be a bum. Be a success. Dominate. Have a good day, guys.